Welcome to today's lecture. Now that you've learned all about project management, it's time to move on to the main topic of our course, which is quality. So in this lecture, we'll be looking at a high level overview of quality. Let's begin with a bit of history. Before the 1970s, most of the world barely focused on quality. Then things changed. Starting in the late 1980s and moving through the early 1990s, quality got everyone's attention and formal quality standards were put in place. From the mid-1990s to present day, the drive for quality has leveled off. Six Sigma and ISO 9000 are today's major quality initiatives. Despite the presence of Six Sigma and ISO 9000, not enough people discuss quality with the same gusto as in the 1980s and early 1990s. This may mean that quality has become second nature or that management's attention is on other things. The fact that many companies overly rely on final inspection tells me that there is still room for improvement. Someone once said, that quality is a journey that has no end. I agree with that. It's important that we continue to move forward and never rest on our current accomplishments. Companies can't become content just because they believe they've journeyed far enough. One way to keep up with quality trends is to become part of a quality society or organization. The American Society for Quality called ASQ, began in Milwaukee, Wisconsin in 1946 as the American Society for Quality Control, ASQC. ASQC came together because of a merger between 17 regional quality societies. Today, ASQ, they dropped the control part in 1990s, has more than 100,000 members. In addition to the Six Sigma Black Belt, Green Belt, and Yellow Belt certifications, ASQ offers Certified Quality Engineering, Certified Quality Auditor, Certified Quality Technician, and many other certifications. So now that you know a little bit about ASQ, let's move on and talk about how to define quality. We can define quality in many ways. When I asked my neighbor to define it, he said, I don't know how to put it into words exactly, but I know quality when I see it. Quality has several dimensions. You can reflect it by grades, good, better, or best, or functions, guaranteed not to leak, works the first time, every time. Perhaps the most encompassing definition of quality is in terms of requirements, design, and conformance. Requirements refer to what customers expect. If you don't define customer requirements correctly, your design and conformance to the design won't satisfy customers. After you define requirements, you need to design how your product will work and also determine how to convert your design, perhaps a blueprint, into products and services that customers want. Conformance refers to making sure that you adhere to your design every step of the way. The best design will be of little use if your execution is poor. When you put it all together, you attain quality by knowing what products customers want, understanding how they should be made and work, and making sure that they are made properly. Other words to describe quality are appearance, such as, I love my shiny new red convertible. Operation, this vacuum cleaner bag is so easy to change. Reliability, I've had it for eight years and it's never quit on me, and value. I bought the same item at the outlet store for 30% less. 
You can also define how well a product or service meets its intended purpose, how well you satisfy customers, and by how many defects are present. The main thing to remember is that customers, not engineers or marketers, define quality. They do this based on their experience with the product or service and by measuring against requirements, which may be poorly stated and ever-changing. Let's agree that quality is a total customer satisfaction package that includes repeatability of performance, safety, serviceability, and is a good value for the money. Now that you have a pretty good idea what quality is, let's continue and talk about its history and then review Six Sigma and total quality management. Think for a moment about the pyramids in Egypt and Mexico. Do you ever wonder about the construction of these miracles in stone? It's likely that workers use brute force to carry out the master builder's detailed plans. By contrast, consumer products from a few hundred years ago, such as clothing, furniture, and wagons, have a different story. They were made using many of the concepts advocated by today's quality experts, such as quality at the source, don't pass on a known defect, pride of work, and training must come first. In the past, workers needed to finish long apprenticeships before they began to work. Since a skilled worker knew the design and how products worked, and also had complete control of the process, quality was practically guaranteed every step of the way. If part A of a piece of furniture did not fit properly with part B, work would cease until it did. But typically, it fit because of the artisan's expertise. During the 1800s, during the time of the Industrial Revolution, many things changed, some for better and some for worse. During this era, machines began to make other machines, and many inventions appeared on the scene, the steam hammer, electricity, and railroads. The good news was the abundance of new products made faster, more quickly, and for less cost. The bad news was the demise of the artisan. A key phrase that appeared during the Industrial Revolution was specialization of labor. Instead of making an entire table, an artisan, now called a laborer, was involved with making just a single table leg. Chances were that the artisan laborer would never again see a finished table unless one was purchased. This destroyed the pride of work. After all, it's hard to become enthused when all you do every day is make table legs. The responsibility for quality shifted from an artisan with big picture knowledge to plant managers who didn't have much sophistication about quality. They didn't know how to achieve quality, nor did they care much about it. Their primary focus was on production. Make as much as possible, keep workers busy, run those machines and bring in the money. Innovations came fast and furious. Consumers didn't give too much thought to product choices because the new products were so much better than what they previously bought. Although they realized the new products had bugs, they just learned to live with them. An example was buying a basic car, a Model T, instead of settling for a horse and buggy. As production volumes grew and products became more complex, quality suffered. A lack of trained workers aggravated things. To reduce the number of rejects, it was necessary to assess products before they left the factory. Many firms began to inspect every unit before they shipped them. Because of the high cost of making a bad finished product, companies began to inspect products earlier in the process, all the way back to suppliers. Unfortunately, 
acceptable criteria were unclear. Due to this lack of clarity, firms had to use precious engineering time to evaluate rejected products and materials. All was not bad, however. A few individuals were rays of bright light during this era typified by high volume production and quality problems. Walter Schuhart, working at Bell Telephone Laboratories in the 1920s, developed statistical process control, SPC, that relied on control charts. Schuhart's work is the basis of today's perspectives on variation, which you'll learn more about later in the course. A few years ago, or a few years later, sorry, two giants of quality, W. Edwards Deming and Joseph Duran, continued Schuhart's work. Then Armin Feigenbaum popularized total quality control, later changed to total quality management, TQM. Feigenbaum popularized this in 1961, and later Phil Crosby coined the phrase, quality is free, in his book of the same title in 1979. These quality pioneers paved the way for Six Sigma.